co-founder of Morizandra Solutions and the convener of Doing Business in Nigeria Conference. I'm excited to welcome you to the maiden event of DBNC themed, Reshaping the Business Environment. As we know, Nigeria's natural resources and its influence in global affairs continues to attract investors, scholarly attention, and interstate partnerships. Today, this event is made possible by our sponsors, Flutterwave and GB Foods, and our media partners, Nairometrics, The Workbooth Magazine, and Business Day. Today's focus would be on how businesses are taking advantages of some of the resources in Nigeria in the midst of economic threats. Plants are playing a key role in business, in driving business productivity. So before I introduce the moderator for the first session, I'd like us to take a quick, quick message from our sponsors. We understand that it's not just about buying a dress. Being able to pay your bills. The ticket is a showy tattoo. But I just paid for it. Promise. I promise. Making that quick stop at the shop or sending some money home for the holidays. We just received the money right now. You're welcome, Mom. I told you I would send it. It's about the 90,000 businesses across 13 countries in Africa who trust us to keep their promises. It's knowing that anywhere, anytime, anyway, you can always pay. Flutterwave, simplifying payments for endless possibilities. Taste is key and that's how we communicate. Best nourishment in every school. Baba, taste it, Baba. Share the love we all take Bama, best scoop of tasty nourishment. Awesome. Um, thank you to our sponsors again. Um, so I'd like to introduce the moderator for the first session. And her name is Amaka Unsofo. Amaka Unsofo is an executive director with Standard Chartered. And she would be moderating the first session and um, giving us some insights on how businesses can thrive why we are having in the current world that um, you know we're facing the, the, the threats and the, the global pandemic. So Amaka, are you there? Amaka, yes, so I am. Okay. Hi Amaka, how are you today? Very well, thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Linda, and welcome everyone once again to the maiden edition of the 2021 Doing Business in Nigeria conference. Um, so to get quickly into the main business of the day, we will be introducing our keynote speaker, Mr. Valentine Ozibo, who will be taking us through the topic, how to transform economic threats, or rather transformation of economic threats into business success. Um, Val, as we fondly call him, is no stranger to the business community. He's a very strong leader and entrepreneur with over 26 years experience across diverse sectors. Val has done 17 years in banking. He has worked across power, hospitality, energy, you know, all the key sectors that drive economic activities in Nigeria. Um, prior to now, he was the immediate past president and chief executive officer of Transport Group, which we all know as one of the leading conglomerates in Nigeria. And their companies include Transport Power, and Transport Hotel. And then just in addition to that, um, before transitioning to head the group, Val was the CEO of Transport Hotels. And we saw what he did in terms of transforming the hotel into one of the hotel businesses. 
in Africa today, earning him his seven star CEO award. Finally, in addition to what Val is doing in the business side, he's also a very great philanthropist. He's the founder of Valentine Tunito Zebo Foundation that focuses on youth empowerment and capacity building. And we can see all the beautiful work that he's doing across the region, particularly his state, Anambra State. So without much further ado, I'll just hand over to Val at this point. Val, we're very pleased to have you. And we would like you to please take us through the keynote address for the day. Thank you. Thank you so very much uh, for that amazing uh, introduction. Thank you. I, I'm glad to see a lot of my friends here. Um, it's been a while I saw them since I relocated to the village. <laughs> um, thank you, uh, Linda, for putting this together, uh, you and your group, um, Maurice Sangra Solutions. Thank you, um, Larry, Ted, and uh, quite a number of you who are here. I will be sharing my own slide um, so that uh, I can best control. Okay. Just a moment, I'll put it on view. Very good, now it's okay. Okay, so we are gonna be talking about transforming economic threats into business success. And I'd like to personally, uh, once again, applaud all my key, all my other speakers here. Thank you so much for this privilege and opportunity to be with you. We have a very short time to talk about this and there's a lot to talk about. So I'll go straight to the point. Um, today we know what we face uh, in the business world, especially with what, um, you know, uh, COVID-19 has brought on us. Before then, we also have an idea how vulnerable businesses have been in Nigeria. Uh, through this, uh, we have a lot to worry about, but how do we begin to shape that worry, take the right decisions and have better story to tell? And uh, so what I would like to do is uh, share my thoughts um, on what um, government would need to do, what businesses will need to do, and how we can also take our destiny into our own hands and begin to reshape our story for good. So, um, but before I start off, I'd like to basically uh, speak on three myths that I think we need to do away with. Um, and the first here is the, the myth of Nigeria being that unique, you know, as though what works elsewhere may not work in Nigeria. The second is the myth of being such an oil-rich country that um, we are wallowing in abundance. And the third is um, the myth of Nigeria enormous mineral resources. And um, the, the whole idea of this is to understand that indeed the whole world is a level playing field for us. And uh, everything that we do here, we can actually excel. You know, I, I, I'm glad to see how you know, Nigeria, uh, some individuals, some businesses have been able to take their story to a level that uh, we, we want, we celebrate today. Uh, Nigeria obviously is a land of abundance when it comes to opportunities. Nigeria is also rich in human talent. Nigeria is, of course, we have a number of natural resources we need to celebrate. We also have good stories to tell, our GSM story, our online shopping story, our banking story, our technology story. You talk about, I mean, Flutterwave, Interswitch, uh, Transcorp. Uh, even in the tech space, um, where you also want to celebrate people like um, uh, Leo Stan AK and what they've done in the conglomerate, in the industry, we celebrate their legal dangotes, in the um, car manufacturing, uh, innocent motors, and in banking, you can't, you know, forget uh, Tony Lumelu and, uh, and uh, Jim Ovia. There are a lot of great minds, great businesses we've been able to celebrate in Nigeria. To tell you that no matter what happens, there's always an opportunity we can tap into. So let's, let's get into this meet of uh, spoken about. The first meet being that Nigeria uh, is so unique. Um, the law of gravity works just the same in Nigeria as it does in Belgium, in any part of the world. The laws of physics are not suspended in Nigeria. Uh, if we do things right, we will get 
the right outcomes. This has been demonstrated over and over again in various businesses, in various sectors and industry, in banking, in governance, in entertainment, in sports, in education, and so many other sectors. Uh, but our people persist in this erroneous belief that we are unique and the principal who work, uh, that, that work elsewhere may not also work here. It is just not true. I believe that is when people are confronted with local realities, traditional custom beliefs, cultural issues, and unable to navigate through them, they give up and declare that nothing works here. They never really did the right things in the first place. And I believe getting things right begins with having the right mindset, the right knowledge, and the right attitude towards a given mission. Let's go to the second myth, which is such an oil-rich economy. Yes, we are an oil-producing country, but we're not close to the top on the ladder, especially right now. Yet there is a belief that we, are, we have so much oil wealth compared to who? This year, Nigeria doesn't even rank in the top 10 oil producing countries in the world. We are at number 15. We are behind a country like Mexico, and we don't even consider Mexico oil rich. Our uh, crude oil is managed as a public resource. And therein, uh, uh, and of course, the economic model uh, is a problem. The, the kind of, the way we manage our crude oil is actually the problem. When we have a population of 200 million dependent on the crude oil produced in majorly five states out of 36, we are not oil rich in the way we speak about. We should be though, if at least 30 of the states or even 20 of the states uh, produce crude oil, then we can, we can boast about this. But the essence of this is to know that we need to work hard. We need to consider how we can raise the competitiveness of Nigeria and catch up with the rest of the world. The last myth I want to talk about is that the myth of Nigeria's enormous uh, mineral resources. This is another one that we has held us back for such a long time, keeping us virtually in a state of expectation that we, never, uh, we will never be able to meet. We're blessed with many natural resources, no doubt, but they are not that enormous, uh, at least the much we have been able to produce. In which commercial quantity, uh, commodities um, table does Nigeria rank as the top three producers? We may have the, some of these potentials, but unfortunately we haven't done well. Not in gold, not in diamond, not in coal, not in bauxite, not in copper, not in phosphorus. Not in helium, not in iron, not in titanium, not where. And we need to wake up. We need to wake up. And this actually, um, the point here I want to make is true sustainable wealth comes from producing value and exchanging it for higher value consistently and in large volumes. We haven't been able to prove uh, this right. Now, the trust businesses, uh, we, this is the main topic for today. Uh, we, if we do a SWOT analysis of Nigeria and the business environment, we will see a huge number of threats. And I don't want to celebrate this threat unduly. With tremendous opportunities, also obviously will come huge threats. So let's begin to see Nigeria as a, a country of opportunities because uh, any threat we see today is actually an opportunity we can tap into. No gain without some pain, no victory, we're on some resistance. We face the tasks. The, the, of course, the, the risk associated with a turbulent economic climate. I mean, in Nigeria, there's a lot we suffer. Uh, I, I've used that word before. We are non-competitive. We run a very inefficient government. Uh, there's a lot of waste. Uh, we can't even, you know, refine our oil. There's hardly any part of Nigeria don't suffer insecurity today. Um, if you talk about the economic indices, we are hemorrhaging seriously. The exchange rate is a mess, the parity. Because if you are doing any business and you need to import any inputs and sell in Naira, you will never make money because of the parity that we have today. And go back to where it used to be. Let's not belabor some of these points. We all know, especially looking at the audience we have here today, we know what issues are. And there are also other threats. We, we just got off the NSAS threat the population budge that if we don't harness this in a manner that can become very you know, opportunistic, we will suffer the consequences. 
And look at the type of government we also have. In most cases, incompetent and inefficient. And there's a lot to talk about when we want to descend on this topic. The reality is that the risks are, are incredible. Uh, the political risks are un unquantifiable. There are plenty to, to talk about. And the inconsistency in government policy, the international business environment even helped to reinforce some of these things. Because of the vulnerability, because of the uh, dependence on, on commodity, when there are price fluctuation elsewhere, we suffer the consequence locally. All of these are threats. Even in the educational system, we have issues to talk about. In the, in the health system, problem. In the workforce, yes, abundance of human talent, but we need to do more to make our people more employable and get the quality of education relevant and qualitative. So there's a lot to talk about when we are discussing threats. Are we talking about corruption? Are we talking about dilapidated infrastructure now? But in all of this, people still succeed, people still thrive, and we need to talk about this. And this is why, where I'm headed to. Now, if you go to the next slide here, I mean, I've, I've uh, more like highlighted some of these, uh, um, you know, threats, but what do we need to do? And let's start with the government. I, I'm, I'm glad I'm jumping from business to government, from private sector to uh, you know, the public office. This is because of inefficiency I see in, in one that's pushing me to move from number two to one uh, as a person. And I'll talk about that very briefly. But government has a major role to play in actually getting the economy more competitive. I, the word, I use that word carefully. Being competitive means that when people uh, do businesses here, and we invest similar amount of resources, effort, and money, the outcome shouldn't be weak and subordinated and less um, inferior to what you get elsewhere in the world. We are in a globalized world. It doesn't matter the fact that we are in a country called Nigeria. If you produce any product and the price is far higher than you can import the same product, you're wasting your time because people are going to import that product and you're business would die. And why would your price be higher when you are producing locally? This doesn't make sense. It is because of failure of leadership, failure in government. How do we rechannel? How do we reshape our country? I don't want to use the word restructuring because people have overused this and we've done nothing about that. How do we get efficiency in government so that businesses can be more competitive, so that that man who produces the same, you know, item in Nigeria can make more money than the enormous cost of transportation added to the imported one, and yet the imported one is cheaper. So let's talk very briefly about the primary responsibility of government, of course, providing security and making sure people move happily and, you know, healthily and safely. And then government creating the enabling environment where businesses can thrive. So they will have to help partner with businesses so that businesses can make money and succeed and build to last. And in this, in an economy like Nigeria, where government transactions account for even on usually high percentage of the GDP, it is incumbent on government to become responsible, become more efficient. Government needs to channel public spending towards activities that will start. There's a lot of wastages that we need to cut. And I want to say, when we also do not prioritize the value of women, we, we obviously become, you know, less, you know, productive. We need to maximize everything that we have, especially women and youths. We've not been able to give proper attention where these, you know, categories of people are able to apply their best and the fullest and towards that reshaping our destiny. When a quick analysis of the rule of government is done, every responsibility that the constitution charges the government uh, with are things, if not done well, will address the issues that will make businesses thrive. Education is important. Infrastructure is important. Healthcare is important. Ease of uh, business policies, economic policy, consistency. These are crucial. These are things government will need to do. But again, we should not raise our hands in the air. If government uh, hasn't done this. There's a lot businesses can do on their own. So let me not spend too much time on what government can do and shape 
and move to where businesses can function, even in the midst of chaos that we found, we found ourselves in. My comments here is uh, mostly directed to uh, businesses, especially small businesses that are actually where our destiny tie, uh, are fully tied to. You know, I, I want to say here, since businesses are run by people, my comments going, going forward in this talk may sound, you know, a person at some point, even esoteric at some. These are ideas uh, are what I believe set the winners aside from the loser. I hope this information will be helpful to everyone who has a business enterprise, whether he is doing a pro for profit or non profit. There are fundamental principles of business management. Uh, so that we do away with these myths I've spoken about, let's you know, talk about those fundamental principles. The first thing I wanna talk about here for businesses, we've got to be brilliant on the basics. We've got to be brilliant on the basics. There are certain things that we must find ways to become as efficient as we can. Whether you're running a business in a time of economic abundance, uh, or tough time like now, you have to get certain fundamentals right. And there are seven operational, you know, uh, uh, process or business uh, uh, elements that we need to figure out how best to get right. We need to get these seven fundamentals right. People is number one. And I'm happy to see a lot of uh, people who are specialized uh, in this area, HR related, you know, uh, in, in, in the operation. I've seen Yemi, I've seen Linda. Uh, people issues are crucial. Operation is another. Strategy is another. Finance is another. Marketing, account, accounting, and technology. It is important to dimension these things and make sure whatever business you're doing, whether in a time of abundance or at a time like this, that you get this right. In fact, for now, you actually now need to which re, 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 rethink your people issues uh, because of the type of the, the world we now live in, the digitalized world we live in. The type of talent and skill set you require today is not what we used to require in the past. How do you dynamically reshape your business in such a manner that you're able to take advantage of the, the trend and tap into the, uh, of course, the vision for tomorrow? On a people issue, one of the most uh, you know, valuable, of course, uh, assets in, in any business is people. You need to get the right team, recruit right, train right, emphasize, you know, how to drive performance uh, by the processes and policies you put in place. And investing in people can never be overemphasized. With the right, uh, everything else, uh, but the wrong people, your vision will not even get off the ground. On the operational side, uh, is, it goes without saying that there's, there's a lot we need to do to deal with issues uh, about moving the operational efficiency to the highest. Uh, there are various things we don't need to reinvent wheel. Go learn uh, Japanese Kaizen, the culture of continuous improvement. Go learn the lean manufacturing process or the Toyota way. Go learn Sig Sigma or Six Sigma by GE uh, that uh, Jack Welch introduced. There are ways to up your ante when it comes to operational efficiency. There's a lot we can do in this regard, so we don't bother reinventing wheel. Strategy is also key. There are all manner of tools we've used in business. I remember when I was in banking and we were setting up businesses in different countries, I used to use personal approach to deal with issues about political, you know, economic, uh, you know, uh, technological, social, to identify which country to go to, which country not to go to, where to, situate your hub approach versus your scope approach. All of these strategy, uh, strategic tools are what we can use. And there's also the most, um, where we have mission objective strategy and tactics. There's the cat wall. There's a customer actor transformation, you know, worldview, owner environment. There's the, I've, I've spoken about that. So the analysis, we all know that strength, weaknesses, opportunities and threat. There's a lot we can do and leverage as business people to see how we can shape our strategy and always, you know, double, double check, benchmark, and improve on strategy. Finance is something that we all again know. Uh, no matter how we look at the environment, we can say that borrowing money is difficult in Nigeria. But people still borrow in billions and succeed. What have they done? 
Maybe they have packaged themselves better. Maybe they have been able to sell their story better. Maybe they, they've been able to, you know, draw partners together in a manner that in, in, engendered, you know, confidence. There's a lot we can do to deal with financial issues and raise the money you need to run your business. On marketing, it goes without saying. I wouldn't bore you with some of this. On accounting, technology, and what I want to say here, when your business has got the right basics covered, then a foundation has been built for greatness. My next and last section of my talk, therefore, is going to be going beyond the basics. Let's go beyond the basics now and move to the general zone. Because uh, what we've spoken about so far, we simply get to going. Uh, to be just maybe challenging the status for a little bit and you thriving and succeeding. But we are also going into how do we transform? So the topic for today is transforming. How do we transform? And we've got to now go into the genius zone. When you have gone through the basics and put yourself on a solid foundation, your chances of failure become slim, almost impossible. But when we are not talking about basic success, we're not talking about basic success here. I'm here today, hopefully, to inspire you to your greater self, to a higher level of performance, to do better than your best. I want us to become uncomfortable with mediocrity of being average, of being just enough. I came to here to inspire today, hopefully, to do the unthinkable exploits, to imagine your widest dream possible, then go out and make them come true. Nothing outside you is keeping anybody small. You and your only, your, your only limitation, once um, you break free from yourself, there's really no limit to what you can achieve. And what is the genius uh, mindset? You know, uh, difficult times call for difficult decisions to be made. Disruptive times call for more disruptors. Disruptors are groundbreakers, trailblazers, who will look at the world's problem and come up with new models for advancing the cause of humanity. In the course of history, global upheavals were followed by great advancements. When I medicine, a new industry, new models for governance, education, economic theories. This, this, the time, this is the time actually for the people who will lead tomorrow to set the stage to lead. The business titans we will be talking about in the next few years or even a decade are thinking, uh, because I think people who, who will dominate their industry right now. So people lead any kind of revolution. And if we take a close look at the people we call world changers, people who make a mark on history. These were ordinary people who caused the disruption at their own time. So what I'm here to talk about more is how we can begin to see ourselves as those disruptors. Some of them I've mentioned already, we need more genesis to emerge in businesses in this country. I believe that this is the only way we can come out of this challenging moment swinging as a nation. We need to activate a critical mass of Nigerians to, to bring their A plus game to the business arena. Who are genesis? I've highlighted some of the big you know, names here um, that we can leverage to, to talk about this. Somebody with a big idea. A big idea is usually world-changing and also by solving a big problem. When the ideas realize, it changes the way we live in a profound way. If you go back to major things that have happened in this world, they happen at a time like this, when people actually thought the world was coming to a grind, then somebody will emerge. Think about Lee uh, uh, Kuan Yew. Think about Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, um, Martin Luther King, Henry Ford, Thomas Edison. Think about all these pioneers. Now, let's talk about obsession with the big idea. Not just passion. They wake up fooled by their idea and go to their thinking about it. Obsession is far much more than just being passionate. These people think, breathe, eat, sleep, and dream their vision. There are people who create uh, new products, create new industries, create new markets. Where there is no demand for a product, they go out and create one. They never take no for an answer. They are also contrarian thinkers. Contrarian thinkers are people who reason independently, resist pressure to conform. Instead of thinking inside or even outside the box, they create new models of boundless thinking. The thinking that sees a business potential 
when everybody, everyone else sees a problem is a concurrent thinking. Limitless uh, possibility. Business genesis are endless possibility thinkers. They don't you know, put a ceiling on what's possible. They go for it. Or boldness. Genesis are people who stir the waters instead of calming down, them down. They are even considered crazy by society because they're dared to be different. They refuse to play small. They reject the status quo. They know they belong in the big league. And I can go on on that. And now let me uh, end this part of the conversation with a call to our women. Let me say something uh, about our women entrepreneurs, business owners, and our women in business. This is a new economy. The fiscal challenges men had in the industrial era is long gone. We are now in the era of ideas. God endowed women with the same brain power as men. In fact, if anything else, even better. Especially when we talk about the things that make businesses succeed even differentially today. Emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is one topic I can spend a whole day talking about, the importance of it in business. And I can tell you, women are much more endowed in this than men. I look forward to our women taking the bull by the horn, as it were, and kicking the ball out of the park. This is not the time for negotiating for a seat on the table. Take up your power, create your own table, create your own boardroom, and create your own throne. I am so glad that so many women have taken up their power and doing exploits already in Nigeria. Urgent need for genesis in Nigeria. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank okay, you. Me... Thank you very much. So okay, please, I'm... please. Yes, let I wish just, for you. Let me just quickly up. round up. Let me just quickly round up. Yeah, I mean, the point here is that we need uh, more genesis in Nigeria. We need uh, to have a lot of people think differently. And for me, I have positioned myself to become one of the actors by shaping away from a business world to looking to see how I can tap into uh, the opportunity in government. I am in this for good reasons. I'm here because I am totally uncomfortable with the status quo. I feel that there's a time is now for us to do the right thing so we can catch up with the rest of the world, both in business and in government. I want to appreciate everybody for the time. God bless you. And I look forward to more interaction in this. And hopefully I respond to whatever question anybody may have. God bless you. Thank you very much, Mr. Zibo. In fact, we're already having people commenting on the chat room saying, well, I'm already getting ideas how to take my small business forward. So this is great. I like the fact that despite all the threats that we have, there are so many successes that have been recorded in Nigeria and out this detail and to analyze who um you know the iconic fashion house Landry da Silva Ajayi. Um, she's been leading the fashion industry for about 15 years now, and I'm still saving up to be able to afford to buy one of her outfits. Landry, you're very welcome. Um, we Thank also you. have Dr. Teddy. Dr. Teddy is an executive director at GB Foods, and they are the you know, owners of the popular brands such as Gino, Jago Mayonnaise, and the Bama Mayonnaise advertisements that we did see earlier. Um, welcome, Dr. Teddy. We also have Mr. Ayong Ebai, who is the Zone General Manager for GE Healthcare. Um, he's responsible for their operations across Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as other economies as well. You're welcome, Mr. Ayong. And finally, we have Mr. Israel Koledewo, who is the Head of Finance for Africa for Flutter Wave. So I guess... Maybe just delving back into the topic that is being discussed, transforming economic threats into business. I think at this point, it will be very interesting to get views from our panelists as well, maybe starting with Dr. Teddy. Can you share your thoughts as well on how we can transform these economic threats into business um, success, just given the diverse sector that the various panelists have? Thank you very much. And thanks, Val, for such an illuminating talk. And thanks again, Linda, for inviting us to share views 
on this platform. I think the I think the one thing that Val has mentioned, and which I also echo on, is the fact that when you look at businesses, businesses are created to solve a problem. Problem, however, you slice and dice it, it's about solving problems. When there's a problem and it is not solved, you need to develop a business that can solve it. I think one of our sponsors here, Fruta Wave, looked at the challenge of payments and thought, okay, they can do something about it. We have a challenge of feeding people and especially providing culinary solutions that they don't have healthy ones. We went out and do something about, did something about it. And when you look at the COVID times, what have you had? You had a situation where there was a lot of challenges and those challenges began to manifest, especially so in the healthcare space and the food space. We found ourselves as a country in a situation where people had to import PPE, basic things, basic things that people can do in their kitchens, in their houses, etc. We're all dependent on China. Now, you also had the challenge with food. At the time this thing started, a lot of countries that export rice, like India, like Vietnam, like Thailand, they suddenly stopped the exportation of key foods that people consume. And what's that key food for us here in Nigeria? It is rice. So when you look at this issue of doing business, the question is what, especially in these times, have been the problems that have been highlighted? The problems that have been highlighted, especially, and I'd like to focus on, on two key ones, have been in the area of healthcare and, and, and food, food and nutrition. And specifically with food, if you were to go backwards, you look at it as a problem in the agribusiness sector. Now, we can sit down and talk about all our problems. Val was talking about the opportunities. And I think I want to emphasize something that I mentioned in terms of the challenges. The challenges we face here are no different. We can sit and be talking about our pity party. We have bad roads, we have poor power, we have this. Singapore had much worse situation when they started and look at where they are today. You go to Malaysia, you go to Thailand, you go to India, Indonesia, they started off much worse than we are today in Nigeria. And now when you compare our economy to the economy of these countries, we are lagging. So we should not engage in these sub stories, these pity parties. We should be saying, these challenges present great opportunities because if you take each of these problems and you try to solve them, you create great wealth for those who solve the problems and great wealth for the economy in terms of developing the GDP. So when you look at the case of, for instance, um, uh, med med medicine, we, could, we didn't have you know, face masks, we didn't have PPE, we didn't have a lot of things. Now a lot of people are making those things. Some people rush to import, but now our people making them in Nigeria. We have tell also when sowing them on the roadsides. You have a challenge of food. Now a lot of people are beginning to realize that we have to feed Nigeria. Most economies that have emerged from poverty, they emerge from poverty by focusing initially in the agribusiness space. When you focus on feeding your people, it mops up a lot of people who have to work the land. We, for instance, as a company, we have a factory in KB State where we are processing fresh tomatoes in Nigeria and the concentrate. I kid you not that we have to, uh, we employ about 800 people who come in every day to help us harvest fresh tomatoes. We need a thousand people. Now look at how much that project is absorbing in terms of poor people who have never worked in their lives. We need more people going into sectors where there are challenges in this, in this, in this economy. Now, when you start looking at the areas of challenges with feeding, challenges of healthcare, you have to train people in advance to be able to do these things. Now that now comes into the area of education. Our schools providing the right setup, the right training for people to be able to do this work. Or are we training them to just memorize things that they cannot use? We need to also orientate our education. Now in orientating that education, therein, uh, therein lies a business opportunity. Running technical schools, running training programs, short training programs, because some of these things don't require people to spend more two years in schools. They may spend three months, six months, 12 months in training programs and come out and they're productive elements of, of, of society. So if you, if you begin to do this and you find that there will be other industries that begin to benefit from it. Because for instance, as these people work, they need to be paid. As people are in the supply chain and ecosystems and the value chain of these systems, they need to be paid. And my, my brother here, I'm sure, will talk about what they do within Futa Wave to solve these problems. The payment process has to be solved. The, 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 the challenge of, of logistics will be solved. And people will now begin to focus on roads. People will be focusing on power. You find that a lot of us who are in industry, we don't depend on power from any grid systems. We have to start generating, 
so, so uh, generate our water, etc. Some day that problem will be solved when people now find that they find a solution that makes my cost of production lower. But we should not wait. We shouldn't wait and be indulging in self pity, waiting for some other problems to be solved before we can go forward. Let's think about what is the challenge, where is the opportunity, and Val has done a great job of giving us some basic principles the, 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 of, of things you need to do to get business moving. My own idea is to look, okay, is look at the problems. Where are the opportunity? There are opportunities in this thing. Let me tap on this opportunity and try and see how I can solve that problem in, 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 the, in this market. And as you begin to solve the problem for Nigeria, other investors out there will see you making money in Nigeria. They'll say, ah, this man is making money. I want to share in his or her wealth. And that's how you saw that Fluta Wave is now a billion dollar, a unicorn in this market. You'll see that people were in fashion. Ah, they're making a lot of money in fashion. Maybe we don't we'll come and invest in them. Okay, so while we're waiting for her to come back, I think we can get um, the views of the other speakers, just the general views on the topic. Exactly. Yeah, so let's um, let's take um, Ayong's view. Mr. Ayong, yes. Yeah, thanks, Linda, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Like, I think um, uh, Ted and Val hit on some real key um, important points. Um, I'll take it clearly from a healthcare perspective. You know, the... The, the current situation has led to a number of um, significant positive interventions into the healthcare space. Um, you've had the single largest investment by the government in the healthcare sector for a generation. Right now, every teaching hospital and every federal medical center will now have a minimum of, <clears throat> a minimum of five ICU beds or, or between a minimum of five up to 10 ICU beds. That's direct funding from government into the infrastructure of the public sector. And you're, so you've, you've literally you know, taken the, the provision of ICU beds 100x from where we were post COVID. Clear. Private sector, you know, with the interventions of CBN that you know, uh, put forward affordable loans into the sector, You've seen a, a significant stimulation of private healthcare providers, uh, increasing infrastructure, updating equipment, providing consumables for, for, the, for the communities that they serve. Again, that would not have ever happened if it wasn't for the intervention or, from, um, or, you know, or, or the crisis that we've lived through over the last one year. You will start seeing significant investment in vaccine manufacturing, um, something that Nigeria used to do many years ago, um, but you know our, our thirst for for oil kind of took us off path. We're now re refocusing back on vaccine manufacturing, you know, and you'll see in the next probably five to ten years because it is a long cycle time to manufacture vaccines. We'll we'll, we'll soon be, be be manufacturing vaccines locally back in Nigeria again. Again, that's an implicate. That's a that's a consequence of what we've lived through over the last few years. And I'm sure there's many others. Investment in oncology, you know, the fact that many people could not fly out of Nigeria as historically um, have done, um, have led to a significant inward investment in oncology infrastructure in Nigeria. And I think Ted mentioned this, you know, the outside will see what we're doing locally. The outside will see what we, we are investing in, our, in ourselves and will follow us. And you'll start seeing over the next couple of years a significant inward investment back again from um, external uh, funding sources. Um, so I think, look, the, the, the story is we have to get our house in order. Government needs to step up, which they have done in certain segments, sec, sec, sections in the healthcare sector. Private sector needs to work with local money, um, you know, relying on, on, uh, on foreign exchange to invest in Nigeria is a, is a cocktail for disaster. So we need to find local money, local sources of money, work with the local banking system, invest in our own infrastructure. And all of this has been stimulated by uh, the crisis that we've lived through over the, 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 last, uh, the last year. So I think, look, every crisis is an opportunity. It's not perfect, but I think that, you know, we've, we've, we've frankly had a generational change in the view of healthcare infrastructure and a generational change in availability of world-class healthcare infrastructure, which also has stimulated investment in skills development, capacity building, and uh, training of our, of our clinical base. 
Um, so for me, I think it's it's uh, you know probably one of the few upsides of, uh, of of COVID has been the fact that finally Nigeria has woken up and is investing significantly in the private and the public sector in healthcare. Yeah, Ayong, thank you very much. I really like the way you tied in the, the threats because again, COVID-19 is one of the key ones that we face at the moment and the opportunities that has brought for the healthcare sector. Um, Landry, maybe we can hear from you as well on your views. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, nice to meet everyone and um, Val and everyone that has spoken the panelists. I completely agree with everything that has been said, um, but as regards to fashion, um, we all knew that about um, 16, 17 years ago, before then, and everyone needed to travel abroad to buy anything they wanted to um, wear. Especially weddings, they felt they had to get their bridesmaids dresses from England, Europe, wherever. But today, um, there's been a great change. I was part of those that started off, um, with fashion in Nigeria, bringing in the ideas of the Victorian era and everything. And everything was looking very good. But um, some of the trends that we've had, like, We've all been seeing it's been the pandemic in the last year to the point where we're regarded as non-essential. I mean, I even gave interviews about the um, fashion industry on channels as non-essential. And I was saying to God that, God, please, what are we going to do to make this a change? There are no ashabees, people are not going anywhere. I mean, once the churches are closed, we all know that fashion becomes something that no one is thinking about. Health was all on our mind and for us to feed. So I wasn't going to go out there and talk about fashion. But there was something that um, we all came up with. Technology played a very big role. And as we can see, we are all coming together this afternoon and we know how to leave our homes. So I think technology has been a very, played a very vital role um, in making a very big difference to the world. Now in fashion, what we've taken up is upcycling. Upcycling is when you have to reuse, not in a way that you are um, re-wearing clothes, it's actually, um, a creative use. Now, this trend has been a big fashion buzz in the fashion industry and it's helped a lot of us. So it's about having um, items that you've had before and then it offers um, added value to garment list. That has created and it actually ends up being high quality um, um, items. Not that it's as expensive as it will be naturally, but um, Things that maybe would have gone for a thousand dollars would now go for about three hundred dollars, which was a big change. And these were the things that we didn't want to use before because we always like to buy, buy, buy. We're a country where for every event we wear new items, and that's um, that has kind of changed a bit. But in, in a way, I would say things are coming back to normal. So in as much as there's been threats, I think it's gotten much, much better. We are back again in business. I mean, I was at an event the other day, and people were talking about COVID. We all have our, our, vac our vaccinations. Though most of us actually. So LK also were thankful that Nigeria, the AstraZeneca, the AstraZeneca was maybe questioning and all that. But I heard um, someone in LK just spoke about the fact that we're going to go back to um, doing vaccines in Nigeria. So we're very hopeful for a better um, world and a better Nigeria. And as things goes on, I think that the fashion industry, I mean, we all, we all even the men are in fashion. I mean, look at Valad. Hearts and everything. I mean, the fashion industry in Nigeria, I think even men, when I saw the men wearing suits, I was even like, ah, this is a very serious matter. <laughs> Mr. Eonget Baya, Mr. Israel Kolido, and I see Amaka looking very beautiful in white. So I think fashion is um, crazy, very big. You know, it's about your presentation. So we can't put it aside. In everything we all do, fashion is um, key. And um, it's added a lot to the economy of Nigeria. And I'm sure you all know that almost every home now has got a fashion designer. I have to be honest, the amount of people that get in touch with me, it makes me very happy that um, things are really improved. People are even willing to have their children study fashion today. So fashion is a very key part of Nigerian economy. And um, I'm happy to see, you know, we've seen how Adire has come in on ground. Everyone is wearing Adire suddenly. There's a time when People thought, oh, why would you want to wear Adire? And Adire is something that is homegrown. And um, in Ushogo and Abelkuta, um, the governors are doing so much to improve that. And it's also adding to the, um, the population of the countries in terms of employment. Employment is also a big role in a, a threat. But we found a way to find ourselves, especially entrepreneurs today, even including myself, you know, because for women, you want to juggle fashion and business and what you do. So I was I studied finance. I was meant to be in banking. And look at what opportunity has created for me in Nigeria in fashion. So I would say that um, the fashion industry um, is working alongside technology definitely. And 
there's been a great change in the upcycling and people are willing to look at things they have in their wardrobes, rewear, reuse, change the beads and it's adding to the economy and um, well, swelling to the bank. So it's not as bad as it should have been when they said we're non-essential, you know, yeah. so... Yes. No, thank you very much, Larry. I actually think that, you know, fashion is one area where the, the whole lockdown and COVID pandemic has actually also really helped the most. My job is made from Nigeria. My bags are made in Nigeria. Nobody is traveling to shop anymore. So these are actually, you know, opportunities for business successes. And then moving on to um, Israel, there has been a lot of talk on slaughter wave from various participants and how they've been able to kind of use that disruptive technology to, 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 to effect, you know, business success. Maybe we can hear from you as well at this point on your views on the transforming economic threats. Uh, um, thank you very much, Amakan. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it, it's, it's a quite interesting subject because um, if, we, if, we, if we cast our mind back to how 2020 started, I mean, nobody really saw how that 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 was how it was it was going to go you know um one thing that we did from um a flutter perspective is when we saw that trade happening uh we knew that at some point um businesses were going to go back virtual you know um at some point the the government was going to initiate the, the lockdown procedure and um, it will be very tough for, business, for people to meet physically. You know, that, that's the conventional way of doing, doing, doing business. What we then did to anticipate that is that we knew that um, people would need platforms to still to stick carry on their business anyways, because people have to carry on living, you know. So what we then did from our own end is to expand the scope of our, of our, of our services. The first thing we did was to uh, expand the capacity of our infrastructure. Uh, basically, what we do as Flutterway is payment processing. You know, anything that... Uh, Israel, you're muted. Okay. Sorry, I, I did quite realize that. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Amaka, for that. I actually thought I omitted myself. So, um, what, what, I, what, what I was saying was that um, from a photo perspective, uh, we saw the way the pandemic was, was going and um, uh, back in 2020, I realized that a lot of people would move their business online at some point because people have to carry on doing business anyway, even if the government initiated lockdown procedures, people will still need to continue doing, doing business. So in order to be able to accommodate that to, to, to contribute to the economy, what we did was, uh, the first thing we did was to expand the capacity of our infra infrastructure. Uh, and in doing that, um, we try to look at how can we, how can uh, uh, servers, our uh, infrastructures um, service more people, you know? And we did a lot in that, in that way. The other thing we did also was that we looked at the traditional things that businesses would do physically and try to innovate that into our platform. So for instance, you want to raise invoice, you have to send invoice to, 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 your, to your customers. We created um, a platform called Flutterwave Store. And in doing that, um, we, 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 we try to make it like a virtual office for anyone doing, doing business. You can, you can raise your invoices there, you can send your invoices to your customers, you can track your inflows and outflows. Um, so we did a lot of things in that capacity to be able to um, accommodate more people that, would be, that we know would have to do business um, online. And also I've talked generally about what um, the other speakers have, have, have said as well. Um, you know, if, if, we, if, we, if we look at the start of the dimension of the economy anywhere in the world, SMEs account for at the, at the very least 60% of the total GDP. If we look at the more developed economy, it's at least 60%. And this is, these are more uh, mom and pop shops, um, people that are self-employed, you know, they contribute largely to the development of the economy anywhere in the world. And the pandemic has made it a, a lot tougher for this particular class of people to carry on doing their business. What I'll just say is that, um, just to borrow a little from what Mr. Vaz said, um, and I like the way he, he talked about the uh, being a genius and all that. You know, all it takes is just to have access to information, have access to information and be able to do a bit more research into what 
does my community need at this point in time? How can I contribute? What are the um, issues that people are facing right now that I can actually help, help um, solve? You know, that that for me is the is the critical thing. You know, that people need to think think about. And we did a lot of that at Doctor Wave, and we've been and we've seen. And you know, um, it's 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 quite interesting that once you solve people's issues, the uh, benefits tend to follow it. So we've seen a, a, a top line grow. I mean, exponentially because we added value to people's businesses and people came on board our uh, platform. So I would just um, 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 appeal to people that are listening right now that we need to think about what are the critical things that people need right now. People still need to eat. Uh, people need to, still need to carry on their businesses. How can I facilitate those, those things? And then we can do a bit more research about how best to go about it and do some budgeting as well so that we don't start a, a venture that we can't really um, um, conclude. So, I mean, those are just my, my thoughts on how to manage the situation. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think, you no, know, those are great views from all the panelists. So I guess if I'm a person starting a business, right, or looking to tap into this idea, what I would really be thinking is, okay, so how do I, like, you know, how do I identify the economic threats that are serious? And how do I know which ones are actually going to last long enough to sustain a business opportunity? So maybe starting with Mr. Valentine Ozibu, I don't know if you can give us your thoughts on that. Um, I'm, I'm okay. Your your network went off briefly, so um, I missed some of your thoughts. Do you mind but, re retaking that again? No, absolutely. So the question is more as a business person, right? How do I, or as it someone who is a new entrepreneur, how can I identify threats that are actually serious, and which ones will last, you know, long enough to sustain a business opportunity? I don't know if you have any views on that. Okay, um, Mr. Val, I don't know if you're still there. Same with all our panelists. I'm Larry, Dr. Teddy, you can share your views as well. Okay. Um, maybe while well, Val, Val's network is being sorted, I could share my views. The thing about it is that when you start off with a business idea, um, that business idea evolves. The business environment is not static. Let's look at Tesla, for instance. Tesla's business is making electric cars. In doing that, they realize that one of the key bottlenecks is batteries. So they can focus on making cars and realize they cannot sell enough cars. Or they can say, ah, there is a new opportunity. And an ecosystem arises. They went into battery making. Now this, I can, given that I studied engineering, I can see that ecosystem evolving to a situation tomorrow where we need to now begin to create hydrogen type batteries that have a longer lifespan. Now, so with each business, there's an evolution. And you start off, you key in one area, you begin to look at the core. What's my core today? So for us, our core is making sure that we can uh, package tomato paste, put some spices, add some value and take it to the market. As we started doing that, we realized, oh, you cannot get enough tomato concentrate in Nigeria. You have to import it. What do we do? We went into farming. So we are now we acquired land, we are farming. Now, what are we seeing around us? We don't have enough accommodation there. So people around there are now thinking about accommodation so that our staff can rent it out. So when you start up, you don't know what other opportunities might come there. You might define your strategic plan and you follow your strategic plan. But as you begin to come across other obstacles and other problems, those other problems also present an opportunity. So you may start up with one thing and find out you're doing something else. If you take, for instance, there's a company in Nigeria now called Animal Care, then the poultry. Their business was to raise chickens and sell people birds and eggs. But what they realized, there's not enough animal feed. They went into animal feed and they produce animal feed to feed their birds. What they realized, oh, they don't have enough of the medicines, but they, they buy such volumes that they can buy a lot and more than enough for themselves and sell some to other people. So they began to go to begin to look at the ecosystem and the value chain of that industry. The, if you think about just a spot in the value chain, you always have problems. If you look at the entire value chain, and the ecosystem of every node in that value chain, you realize that the opportunities or the problems that have to be solved are enormous. The key challenge is starting, not the opportunities that come afterwards. Once you start, um, um, my sister, that Larry there, um, it started in fashion. Now she has, she's designed clothes, made them, she's a banker by training, as I said. 
But I'm sure she has some other challenges. We don't have enough threads in the, in the country. We don't have enough buttons. We don't have enough zips. These things have to be important. Tomorrow she'll say, ah, there's an opportunity for zips. She may start making zips. She may start making buttons, et cetera, et cetera. So the most important thing is not whether that opportunity has enough leg room or enough runway. The most important, the most interesting thing is whether are the other challenges I will face when I start solvable? Do I solve them myself? Or do I look for partners who can solve this problem and are going to it? I have challenges with payment and collections. I don't need to set up a payment gateway when there's foot away. My staff have to wear staff uniforms. Do I need to become a teller or designer to be sewing staff uniforms? No, I go and look for somebody who can, can sew for me. You know, my staff need health care. I go and buy health insurance. But then somebody has to set up good hospitals. Those good hospitals have to be equipped well. That's where and my brother, a young guy, comes in. So you see, start. The key, the biggest challenge in business sometimes is people having these ideas in their minds that are locked in there and they don't open them because they are scared that this idea hasn't got enough long runway. Even the woman who is selling body, there's one woman I admire in one of the markets in Lagos. All she does is sell roasted plantains. And I met her with her daughter in a, one of the markets, in, but just next to UBA, UBA headquarters in Lagos. And I was speaking to her and her granddaughter. Those plantains have sponsored her children to school and university. If she started thinking, oh, I don't have charcoal, I don't have a basin, I can't find plantains, I can't find match, I can't find this, just start. If you have an idea, start. If you don't start, you don't have a business. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Teddy. I think that that's very insightful. Just start. Don't look at the threats and wonder whether you can tackle it. So long as the problems are solvable, just start. Very insightful. Um, Lara, I don't know if you want to add anything to that as yes. well. How exactly do I know if, you know, this opportunity will last and which ones are serious that I should tap into? Yes, I completely agree with Mr. Ted about starting something that you think of because I remember that sticking risk at that time and I started and people actually thought it was a joke and today everyone has joined in this joke and um, it's created a lot of um, business opportunities in Nigeria. Um, one thing I would like to say is that when this whole um, stuff started, something we went into was that we started making PP, healthcare, masks and everything. I remember people were saying, oh no, you have to buy the ones that are imported. It has to be a particular one. And before you knew what was happening, People were buying and buying. At the beginning, we made a lot of money. I mean, it's something that is being made everywhere now. It's almost free in some certain places. But I remember PPK was something that we tapped into in the fashion industry globally. And um, eventually, other people caught up on it. Obviously, there are different versions of it. There are the cheaper ones and the more expensive ones. But one of the main problems I think we actually face right now in Nigeria is, is insecurity. Insecurity is something that I feel is the biggest economic threat that we have now, because most people that were going to come in 2020 when we started were like, they were not going to come, but over the months we've been speaking to people. Now I'm telling some of them that there are people still back down in Nigeria that, and you know, like Ghana, for instance, you know, and I was in Ghana in December and I will be honest with you, I made so much money in terms of, you know, they had, they had inauguration in, in January. So it's always good for people to still see it as, I made them believe that see, everything is fine. And obviously Ghana, Nigeria, it's not that far from each other. People still made their clothes. People still felt the need that they wanted to come back to Nigeria. Even some of my international friends, I've to tell them that they are kidnapping Nigeria, Boko Haram, it does not mean that it's not happening all over the world. It's actually a global problem. The kidnapping in Nigeria seems to really look bad, but it's happening all over the world. And that has not stopped all of us from traveling from country to country. The embassies are back and running. So there are problems, um, the, the insecurity is a big, 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 big problem for some of us that have to have people come in and go out in position expectation. I heard someone talking about how we should try and make things back home, which is what we're all doing now. You know, the PPL care, um, we've had to use even some of our own local fabrics here and people have gravitated towards it and it's selling, they're making money. So my point I'm making here is that despite um, the threat of insecurity, which I would say is affecting the whole world, things are still moving on. So we should not just condemn ourselves every time. I think it's not even as bad in Nigeria as it is in other places. And I pray that they get these people very quickly and I pray the government will intervene because that's, I, I think, the biggest threat that <laughs> is facing the country right now. Thank you very much. No, no, thanks. I really like that, particularly the fact of you now using locally manufactured um, raw materials. 
one of the core crises that we face as well is FX in the country, and that is not going to change. So it's all about so long as you start a business that has value, even if the opportunities do change, the value will still be there and you will still be able to run a successful business. I think, um, I'm not sure if Val is back on, but maybe just moving on to the um, next question that I would like to get views um, from our panelists on. So again, one logical question someone can ask is, you know, yes, there are these opportunities that are brought about by these threats, right? But these threats can, these opportunities can also expire. Like the things that brought them may no longer be there anymore. So how do I make sure that I remain relevant, that I don't fall into irrelevance? What do I do if those opportunities, you know, that are brought about, you know, if these opportunities change, what do I do? Do I just pack up and go? Or do I just change um, strategic direction just to make sure that I remain relevant? And maybe Israel, um, if we can hear from you on that, I think that would be great. All right, um, thanks. Thanks, Amaka. I think this time I omitted my, my mic. <laughs> All right, um, so in terms of staying relevant, um, this is where, you know, last time I, I, I spoke, I talked about um, the need for us to have information. Information is very key. Uh, we need to follow trends. We need to be aware of what's happening around us. Um, and, and, and that would really help shape how we forecast um, our, our businesses. What, what, what exactly would people need in the next two, Two, two to five years, you know. One of the things that we did at Flutter Wave really uh, initially, actually, this, this is how um, the idea of Flutter Wave came about. There were traditional uh, payment processing companies already existing before Flutter Wave. But what we then did was to look at into the future, how can we help minimize the, the assholes that merchants and business owners have to go to to integrate into the different countries that they want to operate in. So let's say, um, let's say um, um, you want to start doing business in Nigeria and Ghana, for instance, you, and you want a payment platform to be able to help you collect your um, collect funds from your customers. You have to talk to different um, companies in all those in all those countries before we came on board. What we then try to do is we then try to look ahead to see how can we best integrate to make Africa into just one one country. So to say, and, and, and that was why we then developed an infrastructure that nobody else has currently that's able to really connect the entire Africa as one. So if you want to do a business anywhere in Africa right now, you don't need to speak to multiple people. Just talk to Flutter Wave. We will solve that problem for you. One of the things we also did as well is to then think ahead. Yes, we are helping merchants collect funds, but people do more than collect. People do more than collect money. People spend money as well. So how can we also help our merchants? spend their money in the right way we then went into payout services as well to say if you want to pay your you want to pay um your um your staff salaries you want to pay for services that vendors render to you how can we help you do that as well we then have to exp expand our capacity to be able to do that you know and um we, we are we're always thinking ahead of you know what do our merchants need in the next two years, in the next five years, what, what would they need? And that is what businesses, SMEs need to do as well. You need to be able to think for your customers. I mean, enter, enter their shoes and look at what, what really do, do they need and what would they need going into the future, you know? For me, those are the very critical things that, 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 that we need to do. And um, to be able to assist people in do, to do that, um, Flutter Wave has really come up with um, Flutter Wave Store that really helps people to I mean, you don't need to spend a lot of time setting up your store somewhere. Just come online to um, and come on board the, the store. We, we've set up everything for you. It, it, it makes it easier for you to be able to um, service your, your customers. So um, I think, borrowing from what, what previous speakers have, have, have also said, the biggest part really, the biggest part really is to have the courage to start. Once you start, other things start flowing, um, uh, following line. And one of the other things that I want to, uh, the last thing I want to say is, is, is that um, people need to be mindful of um, being patient, you know, being, being, being uh, patient enough to let the, 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 the business they are in grow. Uh, one of the major issues that SMEs have really is the, they want to see success happen the first day. Uh, it, hardly, it hardly happens, hardly, hardly ever happens that way, you know. Um, experts will actually tell you that it takes an average business five years before you can break even. Break even even means that to cover your cost, not even to start making profits. 
So you need to give yourself time to grow. You know, don't start, you, people look at the likes of Dangote, the likes of Tony Dumelu, they want to be there right now. It took those people decades to get to where they got to, you know, and you need to start your own as well. As you go along the line, things will happen along that would, that would reshape your business, reshape your idea. As a matter of fact, what you start with may not even be what you end up doing, but you need to start something first, get enough information to be able to start and then evolve the open-minded yeah. No, absolutely. I really like that. To remain relevant, make sure you step into your customer's shoes and identify what they need. I think that's a very direct um, answer to the question. Time to break it. So be patient and be consistent. This is what well, how you know companies can remain you know relevant when the opportunities that they saw and started the business suddenly is no longer there. Can I check if we still have a younger guy with us? Yes, I'm on. Um, you were breaking up, so I didn't quite catch your question. Did you want me to follow up? No, from, uh, I, was Israel, additional, was I was asking if you had additional views on the topic, which is so really the opportunities yeah. that created me become irrelevant. What do I do? Do I change direction or do I just leave and move into something else? So absolutely. Look, let, let me make, uh, maybe, I, maybe I'm the boring guy, right? But uh, let me make relevant reference to the previous question. Yes, start, but have a plan. Do a business plan. Get your fundamentals right before you start. You know, the, the number of small businesses that fail in the first year in Nigeria is significant. I think the last was 80% or something like that. Maybe some of my colleagues can, uh, can keep me straight, but there's a, significant, there's a very high failure rate of, of businesses in Nigeria in the first year. So, um, so yes, look, I'm all for getting stuck in, but have a plan, have a business plan, get the fundamentals right. Um, in regards to, you know, adapting to um, the environment, you know, if I look at, let's, you know, if I look at GE as a, as a business itself entirety and also uh, GE Healthcare. So, you know, GE has been around, I think today actually is its 129th birthday, uh, you know, um, a, an organization that's been around for that amount of time, clearly I see lots of ups and downs. But what they what what is the key thing for them is that they they change they adapt they they you know they acquire and merge they um, uh, push out businesses when they're no longer the focus of the organization by you know by um, uh, refocusing on 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 core sectors as time goes on right so having that uh, ability to be bold change and adapt. Um, as the world changes around you, I think is one of the core key skills um, of, a, of an organization um, such as GE and why it's been around for such a long period of time. If I look at it from a local perspective, from a GE healthcare point of view, 10 years ago, we were um, what we call an indirect organization. We used to have you know, a, a distributor. We used to sit outside in places like you know, um, uh, Cairo, London, Dubai, um, and we used to just send equipment on a boat and leave it to the local companies to, to, to figure it out. Um, we, we, we reviewed, we did the plan, we looked at the fundamentals and realized that that's just not a viable model if you really want to um, grow and, 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 and uh, be successful on the African continent. So we pushed a, a, localization, a localization strategy. Um, and what you see now in Nigeria is we have a local team. We have, we've created over a hundred jobs. Um, the knock on supply chain impact of what we've done by localizing, um, as a, as a Nigerian company in Nigeria is significant. You know, you're probably looking at three to 400 additional jobs that are, are built around our supply chain. Um, and then going back, trying to link it to the first part of the discussion, the context is we have engineers, we have clinical specialists, we have. Uh, finance people, we have marketeers, we have health financing organizations in Nigeria. So when you need to uh, have your equipment fixed, we have an engineer living and working in Nigeria. We have clinical specialists that are going out and training doctors and nurses on how to, one, use equipment, but also how to treat uh, patients. So, um, you know, and, that, and, and we would never have been able to do that if we didn't look at the market, make the changes and adapt to the environment that that we saw at that point in time. So I think you can still go big, you can still be a, a big multinational, but play local and also impact on the small and medium-sized economy as well. 
with your supply chain by by localizing or adapting to the environment that you're you're playing in. But at the same time, you've got to keep on reviewing. You've got to keep on assessing. It's not something that you do and that's it. And you put your feet up and say you've you've you, you've you've arrived. You never arrive in business, you know, because there's always something around the corner that's going to change direction. And if you're not yeah. alert and flexible, then you'll 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 miss a step. Yeah, no, I really like that. I like the caveat you made to the first point. So yes, start, but make sure that you have a plan and that you look at the fundamentals and then remain flexible. Um, finally, Mr. Valentine, I don't know if you're back on. Do you want to share any views on how you know businesses can remain relevant even as these opportunities change? I've been uh, listening to um, a young. I think you just captured my mind. Uh, the reality is my friends my brothers my sisters there's absolute no sentiment in business just take the ego and throw it away and do away with it we have to keep rechecking re in assessing re-evaluating and I, I saw a comment out there that says business plan is not a static thing it's a dynamic process so every time you keep asking yourself how do you continuously improve how do you continually improve? Look at the dynamics. Look at the threats and see how to shape your business. If it's time to exit, you exit. If it's time to redirect, you redirect. There's no sentiment there. What else can you do? And not always even benchmarking. You know, the reality is that you can start off doing something, something much better. And you may think that, oh, what I'm doing is not connected to what I was um, set up to do. But you have no idea that what God has actually done for you, it created that, you know, stepping stone for you to move on to higher there. So do not, um, you know, don't, don't be, don't be, you know, cowed into remaining static. We have to always challenge the status quo. So in a period like this, if you see that your business model is basically uh, extinct or expiring, move away from it. And you can also find new something or new business to do in, in, in the state and old, old industry. What is important is that you keep succeeding. That don't relent, keep succeeding. Do that is looking at every fundamental. And the answer to every strategy is always, this is where, this is where I want to be today. And these are the things I must do to get there. And what is about the capital you employ, the people you employ, the strategy you employ, the, you know, the partnership you form, there are many factors you must bring to bear and make a proper judgment call at every point in time. Does this make sense? Ask all the whys in this world. Why must I continue to do this? Can it not be done better? If somebody is doing it better in this geography, why can't I do better in this country? Uh, even with all the structural issues, the inflationary issues, the tax issues, the FX issues, whatever issue you think you navigate those and get to the end point. And so we've seen people do this in many industries and yours can be an experience. Ways to succeed and build to last. And I must say, one of the ways to get things done properly is basically corporate governance. How do you instill a DNA in your business? How do you go on holiday and your business doesn't go on holiday? How do people come and say, this is the way of doing things? How do you enshrine the right culture in your business? How do you ensure that processes are documented? When people get in there and exit, they have that DNA across board. And doing so means that you have to have proper, process, proper governance, proper structure, so that people can take a decision that are within their power, you have a way of checking back, having accountability, having an audit of the process. And when you have done all this well, and you've documented well, you have enshrined that DNA in people that work with you, you have a system, a business that are building to last. So then, that have been already captured by other, other speakers that I don't want to repeat. But reality is that every moment is a great moment. Every threat is an opportunity. Thank you. This is what happens when you have a company, most importantly, in summer. Last question for the panelists, which is coming to IT integration. I think one thing we always know is that technology is a big disruptor. 
in causing change in a positive way in any business or economy. So the question would be, you know, how has the lack of it been an impediment towards growth of, you know, businesses in Nigeria? And maybe, Lanyo, we can start with you to hear your views on that. We'll only be able to take views from two panelists just in the um, due to time. Larry, can we hear your views on how you think IT, for instance, has you know slowed down the growth or impacted growth of Nigerian businesses? Yeah, so um, like we all know, um, systems integration is very important in businesses. And um, for someone like myself, from taking measurements to dealing with everything you want to do, you want to it's it helps saves money and time and it gets people doing the right thing if you have the right integrational system in place. So we need to make sure that people are more, there's more skilled professionals in, in this aspect of business. In Nigeria, putting things manually has never been the best. And you know, even in our hospitals, I was in the hospital the other day, I was very impressed to see that everything, that because before you take your card, you know, and then they'll be checking for different things. They went in there, they went on the system, they could see everything that I've done. So even with hospitals and in fashion, um, system integration, having the right computer system, it saves money, it's good for security, um, the availability of even, it makes things much, much easier. And as we see today, even like we're all connecting virtually right now, um, just shows the importance of technology and systems integration. So I really hope and pray that, I mean, some of us have it, some of us don't. So I speak generally when I talk about fashion, I'm talking about just myself. I definitely have my system integration in place when it comes to putting things together. I can tell you about all my clients. I know those that make those for over the last 15 to 16 years, but that's because I've, I have that in place. So if we all have that in place, I don't think it should be a problem when someone calls you from even London or anywhere, you can just drop what they've done, going to this um, computer system, putting their name. And um, so it's just good for people to be more educated towards this. I know the importance of having it because um, Nigeria is definitely moving forward. As much as people talk about things are going backwards, I think we're definitely going forward because when Zoom came about, my kids were even the ones that put me through. So it just shows to you that things are definitely getting better. So please, definitely technology, virtually, everything is very important and even in hospitals, I cannot even push that enough. I was very impressed that I didn't need to, I could my card at home and just like, no, no, Larry, everything is fine. Just sit down, we have everything in place. So um, it's very good for us to have technology and the in place, yes. No, I think that's very useful. Thank you very much, Larry. Some of Thank us don't you. know that fashion people think of things like systems integration. So this is an eye opener. Technology is definitely everywhere, it's not just for us to wear clothes and be going. Um, yes, so Dr. Kenny, can I also hand over to you for your views as well, particularly as, you know, just given the way um, GB Foods has grown as a business, what do you think, how do you think technology has actually, you know, will impact the, um, the growth of all these other smaller businesses who are looking to grow to your scale? Uh, certainly. Um, I, I'll start from, you know, we, we serve our customers from the farm right to the dining table. And we, at the farming level, we have... Uh, drip irrigation systems that are 100% computer controlled with software that links to computers in our facilities in Italy, Spain, and here in Nigeria. And our agronomists can sit in their rooms and look at the farm and determine which area they should send water to and which area they should stop water from going into. And this technology, some of these technologies are imported, some of it is from local. So I think technology, everything now has, technology is an enabler for, for, for business success. Uh, and, and I think with, with the one challenge we see is that the ones that you have to pay a license fee for abroad to bring them here, it means you're paying, you're looking for dollars to pay for them. The ones that you've got to pay, especially when you're looking at our payment systems, we do not pay any customer in cash. Everything is digital. So those technologies, a lot of them have been developed locally. So the challenge now, therefore, is for our, our, our scientists, our technolo technologists to begin to develop solutions that are relevant locally. And Fruta Wave have, have, have done that. So for us, technology is key. All our systems, the Guara is our mayonnaise factory. Uh, it's largely computer controlled with very little human intervention. Our cubes technology, where we do our cubes, we do have Gino cubes as well. We have the fastest cubes machine in the world, period. That is here in Nigeria. Yes, we imported the machines from abroad, but those operating these machines are local people. So it's not enough to develop the technology. It's also important to have people who can use this technology and use them efficiently, even if they were not part of the development process of this technology. 
And, and then when you come down to just running your offices, making sure your computer systems work, their networks run, et cetera, et cetera. A long time ago, people were relying on people to come and fix network. And people were coming from abroad to come and help with just making sure their basic networks are working. Now, the, every, most every university in Nigeria now produces a graduate in computer science. Uh, and and these this, this graduates are the graduates who are working to develop uh, tech systems like what we have, what Twitter Wave and, and with the other with our competitors. And I'm sure Aeon also testified that a lot, of, a lot of the technologies and the sciences they're hiring now to support them are coming from locally. So I think the message for us is that we should try and localize the development of some of this technology, especially given that the tools you need to localize are going down in price. A long time ago, when I was in university doing engineering, to get a laptop or a, a computer was an expensive exercise. Now my, my phone is just as powerful as a computer on which I used to run finite element computer programs as an engineering student. So cost of technology is going down. The cost of training people to develop uh, solutions is going down. Let's try and make sure that we harness and encourage younger people to get into these things and use the knowledge they have here locally. And I'm delighted that we have more startup hubs across the country uh, where these, these skills can be brought to bear and where people can begin to develop solutions. You look at what other people are doing in agriculture now, I'm very impressed with how people can get funding, how they can acquire or rent tools using technology platforms uh, to, to, have to get these things. So train, 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 develop locally, localize, localize as much as you can. Thank you very much. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Teddy. So now we're taking some questions from our audience. Um, the first question we have here is, most businesses in Nigeria obviously start small. What would be the role of local government and council in growing businesses? How do we encourage them to be more involved in growing businesses? rather than just collecting levies and rates. I wish Val was here, because I was going to throw the question to him, um, but I think he may be having technological challenges. So I'm just passing on to any of our um, panelists who want to respond to the question on the role of government, really, in growing businesses in Nigeria. Okay, let me, let me start. Okay, All right, sir. The, the, the business of government is government. The business <laughs> of business is business. Government has a role to play. They are regulators. They've got to make sure that things work. They've got to create an enabling environment. And they would always have levies and taxes, etc. Now, the thing is, you just need to, we need to have this understanding of, of what it is that we're trying to achieve. Once you know what you want to do, establish what are the regulatory frameworks that you need to comply with and stuff. So everywhere you go, in any country you go, there are regulations for doing business. If you don't comply with them, you will not do it. I am doing, I mean, in foods, I must have NAVDAC approvals. I must have SON approvals. If I'm going to import some things, I must make sure that I have the banks give me the right documents so customs will allow my things to come through. The number one is to understand what the rules are. Two, if you don't write, like the rules, look for people like yourselves in that sector who are, these, who are suffering under the impact of these rules and ask, what, how do we improve these rules? And engage government on how you improve it. In Africa and a lot of other countries, you find okay, in other continents and countries, you find that companies come together and band together to lobby government. They have people who are doing corporate affairs functions, who have to do other jobs. Their job is to understand what are the rules. Are these rules of an impediment or an enabler? If you think they are an, an impediment, lobby government, push government to change them. Government always change. I'll give you one quick example. The other day we got a, a query from government about from the Weights and Measures Department of the Ministry of Trade and, and Industry. They, they brought a, a law and said, we're not complying with this law. This law was 46 years old. This law made Nigeria uncompetitive. What did you do? We wrote a letter to the Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment and said, this law is a cake. When the law first came out in 1962, it was a cake, it was changed in 1972. It hasn't been changed to now. A lot of us here were not born in 1972, before, before, after, before 1972. We explained the matter to the minister. We said we need some, uh, some allowance to be doing what we're doing while the country looks into the law. Believe you me, within two, three weeks, the minister summoned the guys involved and said, look, allow these guys to be doing what they're doing. Let's look at this law and change it to make sure it's relevant and allows Nigeria to be competitive. So you need to engage government. Don't just complain. If you think what they're doing doesn't make sense, 
point it out to them. Believe you me, they are not unreasonable people. They are like you and me. Some of them are our classmates, they are schoolmates, they are friends, even our enemies. But at the end of the day, a lot of them, and I deal with a lot of them, they are interested in seeing this country progress. As much as people may not realize it, they want the country to progress. So engage government and say, look, what do you think here? What, what do you say that doesn't make sense? And they will listen. They may not do it as fast as you want, but they will listen, they will listen and something, something. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Teddy. So it's more, the question is more, so I'm reading from the Q&A chat, the, hold on. The question is more on basically being able to access financing, right? Discuss loans and accessibility for financing by businesses. So I think in a nutshell, you've identified all these, told people that yes, you can identify opportunities and then go into these opportunities. So their question is, how can I access financing to take advantage of these opportunities, particularly as a small business? Larry, please carry on. Yeah, so basically, um, I would like to say that um, the government is doing quite a bit. I don't know if they're focusing on government or private. Um, in the past, we've had um, banks actually support, GT Bank in particular, in terms of fashion. You know, um, I'm sure most of us have heard of the fashion shows they've done. They've supported with fashion and food and even art and um, photography, even in autism um, in reference to healthcare. But recently also there's NEPC. NEPC is Nigerian Export Promotional Council, aided by Mr. Shegna They're actually doing quite a bit as well. If I re currently, as I speak, there's something on now. I think it closes on Monday. So anyone on this should please go into trying to figure that out. They're trying to help from the time of the pandemic to see how they can support businesses. It's not, it's not actually money. I think they'll come into your company, see what you need and see how they can buy certain things for you and how it can help you to export um, your goods out of the country, which I think is an excellent um, idea. Um, I, I don't know if it's only fashion. I think it's not just fashion. I think it has to do with exportation, you know, because generally for promoting um, the economy of the country. So I think those are areas people should tap into. Um, then even um, I know Access Bank is also doing something um, for women in business. So I don't know if there are women in business. I don't know if they've included men now, but I knew about the women in business from Access Bank. Um, they also had, I can't remember the name of what it was, but I knew they got in touch with me then. In, during the pandemic, I know that um, the Minister of Information and Culture, Mr. Lai Mohammed, which I was part of, I was actually part of two different um, committees in order to help people during the pandemic to see how they can help. Now, I know those things come out quite slowly, but it's just for you to be aware of it, actually. So I think it's all about information when it comes to stuff like this, because I feel some, of, some people actually don't have the information. Because I just mentioned NEPC and it closes on Monday. I don't know if there's going to be an extension. And I know that most times the information people don't actually read, they just have given up on government, given up on everything going on. But please, these people are there give, doing ideas. I'm hearing people are actually not filling the forms. People are not. And if everybody's complaining that they need finance and you're not filling the forms and you don't want them, how do they help you? It's almost impossible. So I feel that most of us, please, let's just try and go on internet. I mean, people can reach, I'm quite accessible. If you want to know about this stuff, I know quite a bit because a lot will come to me and trust me, I'm well aware of different in terms of um, corporate organizations and governments are trying to help people, small businesses. And we all know that most of these people sometimes, I know, I knew that years ago, Stambik IBTC tried to help, I think it was Stambik then, and they tried to give monies, but they'll give them monies for stuff. Someone says she, she's doing um, plastic um, now. Next thing, when they give you money, you buy a car. I mean, come on, you know, so now they, they need to be sure that these monies are going into what you say you want to use it for, which is why NPC has said, you know what, it's not going to be finance, it's going to be actually monetary levels, but knowing what you want to do it for and giving you money, you know, money and I know so many banks. You said, I'm not going to say. No, please carry on. Yes. So, um, I mean, right now I'm actually doing something else for Standard Chartered. It has a lot of things that are helping people in business. So please, let's just try and get into what they are doing. It's, uh, it's on my page, it's on my Instagram page. People can ask me, the numbers are there, you can call them. There are different areas at which, apart from um, corporate organizations, government is trying to help small businesses. So it's for us to have the information and for us to use it. But I think that, Larry, you couldn't have captured it better. That was accidentally captured. There is a lot that the government is doing in terms of funding small businesses. 
And I think I can speak from a banking perspective, right? With everything happening around the um, pandemic and needs to, you know, to grow back the economy, banks are more focused on environmental, social, and governance goals. So being able to scale up small businesses, there's a lot on sustainable funding. There's a lot on social funding. So you know, be well informed. If you're actually looking for something, seek out the information. And Larry has kindly directed you to her page to see what Standard Chartered is doing with her um, in that regard. And the last question that we're going to take from the audience um, is, is it profitable for a business to integrate into other smaller businesses that should feed into it? Is this not how monopoly is created? That's a, <laughs> that's a very interesting question, but um, I don't know who wants to um, take that. Israel, do you want to go? Sorry, you're on mute, please. Yeah, um, it, it, it's quite an interesting question, really. Um, there, there are two sides to the coin, coin really. Uh, when you talk about backward integration, what, what that then, what, what that entails is um, big manufacturers trying to look for the source of their raw materials and trying to have a direct line with them. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good, it's, it's over, over time, it's a good way for them, a cheaper way for them to source raw materials and to have a very secured means of getting their raw materials that they use for business, you know. And I know currently now, a lot of all these manufacturing companies are actually doing that. Um, the way they do, they do it right now is different from, slightly different from the way of saying, let's say they want to acquire the business that's actually supplying them. I know right now that the number of manufacturing companies that enable farmers, for instance, uh, they give them the equipment, they give them the support that they need to do to farm, uh, have, have a large farm, farm produce. What, what the farmers need to do is be able to secure land, a large like hectares of land that they used to, 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 to farm. And then these manufacturing companies will then give them the equipment that they need to farm the land, have some form of management with them or to have some maybe some exclusivity. Obviously, if you've put your equipment on, on someone's land, you want to have access first right to their uh, farm produce. So I know a lot of that is happening right now. So again, it goes back to having information, you know, and a, 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 bit, a, a bit search on the internet would actually give us some of this information. Manufacturers right now are actually doing more into backward integration, connecting with farmers directly uh, to help them expand their, their capacity and thereby also ensuring that the uh, manufacturing companies also have a um, steady source of raw material supply. In terms of the monopoly uh, aspect of it, um, business is business, really. Uh, it's, it's a matter of who is able to best um, take advantage of the environment. And that is where we also have uh, the government come, um, come in as well. Because uh, I've also seen, like, if you, if, you, if, you, if you look at more developed countries where there is higher risk of monopoly, what, what those governments then do is try to step in to say, once a company hits a certain um, threshold, either in terms of revenue or, or in terms of other um, parameters, the government then, then come in to, to kind of find a way to ensure that smaller businesses are not, are not unduly uh, impaired by that, by that big enterprise. Um, and I know progressive, I mean, we're not, we've not even gotten there yet in Nigeria. We're still light years um, behind many, many people. What we need right now is more participation, you know, in business. Like I said, um, when like um, people, people generally tend to leave farming, for instance, to more people in the rural areas and all that. But right now, if we have more, um, if you have more graduates, you have more graduates going into farming, um, have more people that are well informed, so to say, go into farming, you will be better able to, um, to, to have your farm produced in a way that the traditional farmers don't know about. So for me, it's more getting, getting more people into doing, doing businesses, having access to information. Let us get to, the, to, to, to a point where we have influx of people doing, doing businesses sustainably, and then we can then start worrying about monopoly later. Yeah, absolutely. I fully agree with that. I think different businesses, different dynamics. There are several successful giants that have been created in Nigeria today that their core strategy lies around being able to control the entire um, value chain. But again, there are instances that someone has put on the chat where partnerships um, still works because that still gives you access and control over the value chain. I think we've run out of time now for questions. So we will be taking final remarks from our 
um, panelists in just 30 seconds. I know you have a wealth of knowledge, but this will just be quick passing remarks. Um, starting with um, Valentine Ozibo. Mr. Val, are you there? Yes, thank you. Um, sorry for uh, what the internet has done, but let me thank my fellow panelists for an amazing you know, session we've had. Um, I, I've also learned a lot listening to some of you. And for the people out there, uh, if you're in small or big businesses, just note that your destiny is in your hands. Uh, there's a lot government can do they're not doing. There's a lot they're doing now to scratch the surface, but there's quite a lot, I believe, that they can do to help to push businesses up and raise the level of competitiveness in Nigeria. But don't wait for government to do this. Figure out how to you know, delve into these issues and solve the problems you have. And in, in so doing, do it so well and be efficient in it and continuously improve. Keep challenging yourself until you keep getting to the point where you can become that big genius out there that we mentioned when we talk about the likes of, you know, the Elumelos and Ovias and Dan Gotes. There's a lot that we can do to solve our problems if only we can hold our destinies in our hands. Good luck. Thank you very much. Ayong? What I would say is um, partnerships are key. Um, I think that... Um, you know, what, what I see in uh, the sectors that uh, uh, we focus on is a lot of one-man bands um, that don't want to work with their neighbor and then both fail. So I think um, ego to one side, partnering, it, there's, there's, a, there's a lot to, to talk about um, economies of scale. Um, if you look at the health insurance space, if you look at the um, hospital, uh, clinical space, there's a lot to to, to uh, there's a lot of growth that can be driven by um, partnering and developing and having a bigger platform to um, to go after the markets. Um, so uh, look around the world. You know that's how a lot of the you know larger companies have grown is by partnering, acquiring, um, going into JVs. And I think that's uh, an important uh, uh, opportunity for Nigeria. And also, final comment is Nigeria is bigger than Lagos. So get out of Lagos. There's a lot out there. There's a huge opportunity out there. And, um, you know, throw your net further afield and uh, there's a lot to go after. Thank you very much. Larry. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I've definitely learned a lot from this panel. Um, I thank you all for, for all of um, for the world of experience that you all have in your different sectors. But one thing I definitely would like to say is that um, as Nigerians, we all need to take advantage of um, to go into risk taking. Risks are very important for you to move forward in business because the population in Nigeria is just so, so enormous, like in fashion. And um, we have to be aware of competition. Um, we're very, very competitive and that is very, very healthy. And I think that for most of us, some people are actually scared to start. Mr. Tedungu uh, mentioned and stressed the importance of starting something, which is very important for everyone to be aware of. I think if you can start and be unique and be different, you can actually make a difference and people will look to what you want to do next and next and next. And eventually, it will eventually end up in success. Thank you very much. And have Thank, a good you, Thank you very much. Dr. Teddy? Thank you. I think um, what I would say is, uh, identify the problems in the society and embrace them. Learn to love problems because problems present opportunities and these opportunities present business platforms. And when you see that platform and it's one that you are passionate about, start. Of course, you can't start without planning. Plan, do a three-year plan. Five years when you're starting at the beginning is very, it's a long stretch, do three years. You know, you may only be right in the first six months, but as you go along, Keep course correcting the plan. The plans are not static, they're dynamic. You course correct as you go along. The opportunities start up with might change and evolve into something else. Embrace it. Embrace innovation. Look out for innovation and keep embracing it. And as you attack and start, don't think government is your enemy. Engage government. Engage your bankers. But don't sit and complain. All of these institutions have a way and a process for doing things. If banks have money for you, you have to apply. If you apply, you have to know what it is that it takes them to give you the money. If you don't meet their standards, they will not give it to you. They're not a charity. They're a business organization. 
government has to regulate things to protect the rest of society from dodgy and bad businessmen and things that people may do wrong unconsciously. So engage government as well and know what it is that you need to be doing to meet their rules. And you continue, keep sailing. The seas will rough some days, it will be smooth some days, but just keep going. Make sure that when you get into the sea, your tank is full, your engines are good, you have a good crew with you and you sail. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And finally, Israel. Uh, um, thanks. I, I, my, my, my final words would, um, would be to encourage SMEs to be patient. Um, be patient enough to watch your business grow. Like I said earlier, it takes, it takes a minimum of five years for a business to break even. That's not even talking about making profit. So if you don't see yourself making profit in the first two, three years, don't, don't worry. As long as you have a solid business plan and you're open-minded, open you're aware of your environment, the dynamics of what is changing, keep at it, keep, keep doing it. And over time, I mean, things, things, things would improve. And, and also, I like the part of um, the engaging the regulators as well. What we've seen in our space is we've seen a lot more collaboration uh, among ourselves and the regulators um, in terms of having, having sessions with them and discussing what, what, is, what, what really is the landscape of um, our fintech uh, going, going into the future. You know, so we've, 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 we've learned over time, not just step back, we've learned over time to embrace the regulators and, 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 and work with them to shape what we want to see up, um, happen. And the last point I want to also touch on is on people, because I saw, I saw a question about access to, to uh, finance from maybe banks and all that. Banks will only give um, loans to people that they understand their business model. What do you have documented that banks Banks can review. Do you, do you do you do you even have records of your past um, spendings, your past business dealings? Are you keeping proper books of of your of your business? If you don't have all this in, in, in place, it will be tough for for banks to to give you facilities. So let's let's be patient. Let's 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 persevere. It takes a while for businesses to grow, and let's keep proper documentation of our business dealings. It helps in telling our stories to people that want to come into the business. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Israel, and thanks to all our distinguished panelists for very insightful um, conversations. I liked what someone just put on the chat now from Maureen Okodi, learn to love problems. That really summarizes the you know, topic for today because therein lies opportunities. Thank you once again. Um, we will be heading on to the session two, which actually deals with um, engaging talents for business continuity. But prior to that, we're going to take a very short presentation by, by Flutterwave, led by Yewande Akomolafe Kalu, who is the head of storytelling and branding for Flutterwave. Yewande, over to you, please. Thank you. Bye. Hello everyone, my name is Tosin Lawal, I'm the co-founder of Smoke Barbecue in a Box. Smoke Barbecue in a Box was founded by myself and Olua Tosin, my wife. We pretty much have a passion for cooking, you know, and it has been a passion that has stayed with us over the years. You know, uh, we, we grill and cook for ourselves, our family and our friends pretty much on a regular basis. And that passion to create something good, something unique, is the reason why we thought that we could put this out there, you know, and have the larger populace experience what we experience as our family. At Smoke Barbecue Box, our philosophy is togetherness and family values, which is the reason why we created the business and we created our products around this business. At Smoke, though I'm the co-founder, I'm also the pit master. So I'm pretty much the one who is in the back end. I love grilling, I love getting my hands dirty. Our typical daily process starts by us prepping from 10 p.m. to about midnight. And from 5 a.m., I wake up to get the grills up. And uh, we are cooking and grilling pretty much up until 2, 3 p.m. during the weekends when we work. It's something that I'm passionate about. I don't see it as a job, I see it as a passion, which is the reason why I can stay on my feet for seven, eight hours doing the same thing day time after time, day after day. When we decided to start this business and uh, we realized we had to reach our customers, we had to bring something up the best way to be able to put our products out there and for our customers to be able to 
see the products and also create a seamless payment process. That research process led me to identify the Flutter Wave store. It was a no-brainer for us because apart from people locally being able to pay for things that we sell, we've been able to have customers from international, uh, from the US, from the UK, from Qatar, who are also able to pay through the Flutter Wave store you know, for our products. So being able to utilize this platform for our business, you know, I would say it has been immense and it has actually helped us grow quite rapidly within the few months that we have been around for. Another important thing that I would say that the Flutterwave store also helps us with is, you know, the, the database that we're able to collate um, from having our clients, being able to reach our clients and also being able to track you know, how um, we're doing on the platform and how many orders we're getting. For a small business, I think that it's such a small price to pay for that kind of service you get from, uh, from a platform like Flutterwave Store. And it's really, really helped our business in the short time we've started. At Smoke Barbecue Box, we create a mouth-watering flame grill from, from our home to your, your home. Okay, hello everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Yoande Akomala Pekalu. Uh, as you heard earlier, I lead the storytelling and branding team. And the video that you just watched is just one of the 25,000 businesses that currently use Flutterwave Store. So I wanted to introduce Flutterwave to you as a company, but I wanted to do it with a little bit more context. So you see the real businesses that use us. So Smoke Barbecue in a Box is one of the businesses that uses Flutterwave to sell food online. They started during the pandemic because they wanted to be able to sell, um, you know, they were working from home, they were staying at home and they wanted to just be able to sell without the hassle of creating a website, figuring out how to receive payments. And so they found Flutterwave Store and they were able to use that. As, as you can see in the video, they were also able to receive payments from customers within Nigeria, but also customers outside of Nigeria who were able to make orders for their friends and family in Nigeria and then have it de delivered to the friends and family as a full surprise package without having to tell them or send them the money to get their gifts by themselves. That's just one of the things that we do at Flutterwave. We help businesses to be able to send and to receive payments wherever they are in the world. We help them go from local to global businesses. You know, we have, um, we like to say Africa is not a country, but we make it feel like one. When a business has a problem of starting out, the first thing they think about is payments. I want to be able to receive payments from my customers. And then sometimes I want to be able to receive payments from customers within my geographical region, but I want to be able to receive payments from them when they're outside of the country I am in as well. And I don't want them to also go through so much stress. You know, in Africa, um, one of the stats is that only 1% of payments um, are actually card payments online. That's something people, people don't have trust in, you know, putting their card details online. And Flutterwave, we identified that issue very early on. You know, we prefer, like in a country like Nigeria, we prefer making payments through USSD, bank transfer, you know, we use your short code so you don't have to put your card details on any platform that you don't trust. And we identified that a long time ago. And so we plugged into the popular payment methods in different countries. That means that I, as a business owner in Nigeria, if I wanted to receive payments from a customer who is in Ghana and who prefers to pay with MTN mobile money, not, not through their card on my online platform, they can easily do that because I am a Flutterwave merchant and I'm able to receive payments through Flutterwave. That's just one of the things that we do for businesses at the moment. When the pandemic hit, we really prioritized helping the businesses that were using Flutterwave to continue to thrive and to continue to grow. And one of the other things that we did was we started a series of webinars called Grow My Business Webinar, where it's knowledge sharing session where you can hit, learn about finance. Israel has hosted two two sessions on the Grow My Business webinar. You can learn about finance, you can learn about marketing. You know, we do a lot to be able to reach our customers and help them with the needs that are not being met. And we're very excited to, you know, be a part of the Doing Business to Nigeria conference. This is a great platform for us to talk about, you know, transforming economic threats into business success, you know, engaging talent, being able to truly grow 
Nigerian businesses that are going from local businesses to global businesses. Thank you so much.